Welcome back, everyone, to the Lobster Roll series, week, se week seven. I'm your host, Dominic, or Shadow Fury, whichever you prefer, and we are into the winner semifinals. This is, of course, a 2v2 series, and we are currently setting up the, the next match. And so it's going to be Gota and Crow versus Legomino and Bakuhatsu. Because that is going to be a winner semifinals match, which is going to be played right now, so I might as well do that. And then the other winner semis should be up right when this one's done. So yeah, first starting out we have Is Key it has been banned. Because of course it has. So yeah, I should probably go over the maps for this particular round of the tournament. So we have... Lonely Oasis? No, oh, hang on. So Lonely Oasis, a map which I haven't seen in a long time, but strong 1v1 map. I mean, it's very flat, but it's flat and cliffy. Kind of StarCrafty in the way it's set up. I'd be a little surprised to see it in 2v2, but I think it would play reasonably okay. Shimmer Shore, which honestly I'd be surprised if we saw it in 2v2 because that just... Ah, I don't see that working. It's a famine map in a 1v1 context. Seeing it in 2v2 would make very little sense. Vantage we just saw. That worked out pretty well. Bit small, but it was, it was a good, it was a good tight fight. Like you, you had, you had back and forth. There was room to breathe. There was room to build up. So that one works pretty well. Zed, I'm a little surprised it's in the pool. Just because like the shape of the map, you do kind of snake along the top. Like that Zed itself is flat ground. There's hills in between that bots can go between, but the flat ground is kind of the only relevant thing. And then a two v two. I expect you'd have one player kind of trying to control the flat ground and the other one trying to sneak around the corners. It would work okay, but I doubt we're going to see it. Hourglass just got banned as well. We saw that last week. I think Hourglass is actually one of the better maps here for 2v2, just in terms of resources. Izki Channel, also we're not going to see. It's not as famine as Shimmer Shore, but still pretty sparse on metal, so I expect 2v2 would just be an absolute unpleasant knife fight. And Firebreak, which... I have not really seen played much. I think I've seen a few games on it. It's... It's one I do hope we see, but we aren't going to see it today. Because it has been banned. Oh, Vantage also got banned. So we're at Shimmer Shore or Zed. So we're probably actually going to see Zed. That, I'm, I'm really curious to see how Zed plays out in a 2v2 context. I haven't seen it used in a long time. It's like it's one of those maps that's really it, it's it doesn't necessarily have to be choke point in the center, but it has a tendency to choke point in the center. So I don't really know how I mean, like I said in 2v2, I kind of expect it might actually not be so bad, because in 2v2 you'd have someone being able to focus on that corner on the southeast northwest, use that to like go up and down the ramps, and then hit the side. But no, we're actually banning Zed. So we're going to be on Shimmer Shore. I am surprised. But I guess that's what we have. So yeah, Shimmer Shore. Wow, this is this is gonna be a short match. I mean, Shimmer Shore I think has twenty metal in total across the entirety of the map. For two v two, I don't know. I really don't know. I think Zed would have been a much better option, but so it goes. We have Shimmer Shore. <laughs> it's going to be. Hey, we get a C map. I did not expect we'd get a C map. be perfectly honest so yeah with that we are gonna be moving on gonna be moving on to the last team up i ever expected to see yep well anyway hey at least we get some variety we get a c map i mean that's how often do we get to see that huh i mean really Okay, I was a little... I was exaggerating a little bit. It's actually... Exaggerating quite a bit. This map's a bit... Better stocked than I thought. 
not a lot of stuff in the center to fight over, but you are working with, you know, let's see, seven and a half here, seven and a half here, it's 15, and there's seven, uh, five, it's 20, 30, yeah, like 30 metal per side. Or did I count this? I counted this, my bad. It's like 25 metal per side, so it's actually, it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. That's if you split the map in half, mind you, and given the shape of the map, it's more likely you're going to get, like, this, which ends up being 20-ish metal per side. Again, even, I mean, that being said, though, that's, like, 25 metal total, 30 in 2v2. That's still not that much. I mean, let's be perfectly honest. 20, 20 to 30 in 2v2 is, like, early mid-game. Sorry, in, in 2v2, yeah, it's, it's early mid-game. So, in 1v1, it kind of makes sense because you have, again, 20 to 30 is more mid, like solidly mid game. But 2v2, you can usually get 20 to 30 within a couple minutes. So, we're probably going to see expansions within the first couple minutes, and then everything is just going to be fighting for what little resources are there. What few expansions remain that haven't been claimed yet. And then from that, well, that is going to be a knife fight. So yeah, it looks like good at planning expanding over here. Crew already going to the north, and similar expansion patterns with Lugamana and Bakahatsu on their end. And we begin. Alright, so Bleed Nick, we actually have the Amphibot Factory. Ships and Amphibots. Ships and planes coming in from the southwest side from Crow and Goda. And Crow has learned! You go for air to go for quick ravens! I'm actually already knew that. I just don't know why they did that Phoenix build last week. Anyway. Quick ravens. Not a bad choice. Again, I expect this match is not going to be a particularly long or drawn out one. What the? Why did they lower the speed? Okay. Must have been a misclick. That, that shouldn't be allowed to happen? Crow is in a moderator. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by the technical details. Doesn't matter right now. Why are you... <laughs> Whatever. I don't know why Crow is messing with speed. They should not do that. I mean, that's... That should be a DQ thing, honestly, if you mess with speed. Anyhow, back to the match. Bleatnik is expanding kind of slowly, honestly. Entirely based on commanders. Whereas Southwest, I mean, actually, not Southwest, same thing. My bad. Golda finally getting a Mariner. Entirely for use in going towards their base. Okay, that's weird. What the heck? What happened to the rally point? What a strange combination of rally points. Well, at any rate, neither team really finding a particular advantage thus far. I mean, Bleednik finding a little bit of scouting advantage over here to the southwest of the Hunter. Just scouting out, oh, what is going on? Where is Crow's commander? Where is any Mariners that might be in play? Or anything else? What is Crow doing in terms of their units? Oh, the Hunter... Did they see it? I think they saw it. No, they did not see it. They actually don't know that there's an air factory. This is going to be a bit of a surprise. I mean, Crow's got to be careful here, actually, make sure to land that, but... Yeah, they're... They're not doing too bad when it comes to the deception side, and Southwest is running ahead when it comes to economy. Bleednik still kind of catching up. I mean, it's pretty... It's even enough, so it's not the biggest deal yet. And again, the way this is currently playing out, it looks like the map will just be split in half. So it's not going to come down to, you know, one side pinning the other in a corner. It's entirely, it's entirely even split. I mean, that being said, Bleeding is certainly doing their best to split in a corner. Oh! I didn't even notice. Oh, that is clever. Gore gave Crow one of their hunters to give the impression that Crow went for ships. I had to try to hide the ruse. And for those of you wondering, the stream is on a delay, so that hopefully this, like, this shouldn't be sniped, but... 
They take too long, it might end up being. The delay is only so long. Still, though, Southwest losing loads of their ships in the center of the map. That leaves them wide open. Go to rebuilding, but you now the attrition is massively in favor of Bleednik now. Switching over to Corsairs to make that attrition gap even wider once they get into combat. Oh, I see. Nicely done. Build a plate off that. So yeah, both players do have ships thanks to the plate system. Because you can't actually build a plate off of your teammate's factory in a 2v2 or other team game. Which is a really cool little feature. Yeah, instead of having to donate ships all the time, you just or donate units of a particular type all the time, you just make a plate and build them yourself. But yeah, with all these Corsairs, it's becoming a lot easier for Bleeding to maintain map control over the center. And now we're seeing the Ravens come out. This is it. Do or die with the Ravens. If they can take out... I don't know, I mean... Honestly, they kind of take out something on the order of a commander or a factory. Factory's too expensive. The plate could go down. Commander would be too hard to spot. What are they going for? Okay, well, there's nothing really to contesting right now, so they have time to scout out to figure out a good target. Oh, they could get rid of the Antbot factory. No, getting rid of the plate instead. Good choice. Send the rest to deal with some mexes, and that will be a really solid trade. Or hit the Antbot factory ineffectually. You need five to get the Antbot factory. That was three, I'm afraid. I thought they'd actually go for the Antbot factory directly. And that'd be their first target. But now that has been revealed. We should be seeing... Well, we're seeing sirens. We're not even seeing enough threat to go for Zephyrs. Just sirens. Sirens should be enough. Of course, the sea game is still a very important part of this, and while Gota and Crow are losing a lot of map control, they might still be able to pose a threat. I mean, there are half a dozen ravens just hanging out. There's no air pad for them, which is a bit of an oversight, but they are still hanging out. That is still a persistent threat. And that is going to be an issue. I mean, that's something which Bleednik... I mean, they, they did just lose this, but I don't know how much of a problem it's going to be. Yes, they lost the plate. That's true. But they also are way... Actually, no. no. Okay, that plate is a lot of the attrition right there. But they still have the economic advantage. They still have reasonably strong armor. Actually, let's check the composition. Hunters. Hunters Corsair versus mostly Hunters. Corsairs will win this fight. Archers as well as, as a support force here. And the Siren Corsair against Pure Siren. Yeah, the victor is pretty clear. Unfortunately, Crow, they don't really have a whole lot that's going on that isn't just these bombers. Now, the Governor's commander is going to die. That is one thing. That commander's done. So, it still managed to at least clear things up a little bit over to the northwest. It's going to require a bit more attention from Bleatnik to keep, keep that under control to keep... Crow from expanding over to the northwest themselves, contesting all these metal extractors. But again, that was I mean that was a blow. That wasn't the biggest blow. At the same time, counterattack coming in here. Archers being able to basically take out everything. Ooh, but of course Ravens can hit underwater. So ultimately, this is starting to become a little bit trickier for Bleatnik. Southwest is winning on attrition. Even taking that factory into account that was taken out earlier, or the plate rather, they are still winning directly on attrition. Gota with four sirens are already built up and nothing really to counter them. A couple of Mistrals are in play, which is, man, it's a good choice. That definitely is a strong option to counter them. But I'm not just, I'm just not sure there's enough firepower, regardless of the type of firepower, to actually deal with this stuff. Blackbots is commander still alive, but it's only a matter of time before the Ravens decide to pick them off. And the air pad is in play, just over in the water on the western side of the map. So Blackbots' commander needs to be careful. I'm a bit surprised still no Zephyrs. I am really surprised no Zephyrs. We might be seeing Sirens. We are seeing Envoys. I mean, that's definitely going to help punch through this western base and get rid of the air pad. But again, where there's no anti-air. The only closest thing to anti-air is the siren. 
And here come the Ravens, take out Bakwas' commander, nothing here to stop them. Oh, except the Anglers, but the Anglers are not enough firepower. The Ravens get in, one goes down, the rest survive. And that is a very strong blow. Bleednik is looking really desperate right now. I mean, they're, they're pushing back. They're trying to get out of this, but again, it's just Bleednik, they have to reclaim, that's about all they have. The, their attrition's going down, their economy's going down. This Raven swarm is causing loads of problems. Finally able to take out some of it. And thankfully for them, they've managed to maintain map control. Like, they lost the commander, but they still at least have enough of an army that the Southwest get Crow and Gold cannot easily push in. So far, not a whole lot of change to that. Siren Envoy coming up as a counter. Siren might be in trouble, honestly. Or sorry, Envoy might be in trouble. The Sirens will be fine. The Envoy might be in trouble, though. Just, there are enough units... Like the Mistrals are set up, you have the Hunter set up. And the Sirens are able to protect the Envoy for now, but it is just a little bit trickier. Mistral coming in. Ooh, nice shot against the Siren. Nice shot across the bow, as it were. And of course, the Anglers maintaining their position, clearing out the skies. However, this, this firebase right here, that is what I'm worried about. The fact that there's three Sirens and an Envoy protected by Urchins. Two Envoys, actually. That could really start to punch through the forces. Now, granted, there aren't a lot of slow-moving forces that the Envoys can really deal with efficiently. Like, the Envoys on Bleatnik's side are in a decent position to get rid of the Sirens, but there's not a whole lot of slow-moving units on the on Southwest side. But that being said, the Envoy for Bleatnik is getting into a lot of trouble now. Hunters sacrificing themselves to try to stop it from dying and not able to do so. Envoy shot from the other side takes it out. I mean... Their cruiser was sunk. Good guess as to the position. And Southwest now looking scarier than ever. Bleatnik rebuilding that ship plate, but seeming severely uncertain as to exactly how they're going to contend against, I mean, all the ravens, all the sirens. It's just they are starting to fall pretty desperately behind. Again, if we look at the army value right now, it is... It's looking bad. Army value... The 3,000 metal discrepancy between the two. And that is going to be difficult to change. Go to the commander, actually, coming up a little in front. Not a bad vengeance, though I don't know that's going to be the ideal target. Really, the sirens are the threat. The sirens and envoy are the th are envoys are the threat. Everything else is secondary. If you can get rid of the sirens and envoys... There is a chance. Go to maintaining that on infinite builds. Not looking to change anytime soon, and frankly, I don't blame them. There's not a whole lot to change too, really. The Mistrals haven't been able to put a significant dent in the Siren forces. And the bulkhead up isn't, I don't see it really helping yet. It, it will be useful if there's a base siege, but that hasn't yet happened. Mistral over to the southeast. Looking to work through, grind away this eastern expansion to at least provide another opening to get in. But that is looking pretty desperate. Bleatnik gradually having the forces ground away. Managing to get back a few wins on attrition. And granted, they take out one of these sirens, which they are nowhere near doing. I mean, the, that's, that is what these mariners are for. Repair the lot, and also no one really re reclaiming this. I mean, we have conscious nearby, but not a whole lot. Why are you adjusting speed? I gotta double check. I think there's a rule that allows you to prevent adjustments of speed at the technical level. But yeah, with that, we have what is looking pretty desperate, honestly. I keep saying that. I keep saying that. In fact, maybe I'm wrong. Caretaker is being built up for Bleednik. They're going to be able to start getting Reclaim going. It's hard to know how long it's going to last. But worth noting, these Ravens have basically committed suicide. They went for a lot of raids over to the north and have lost their... lost most of their number as a result. Crow has, however, pivoted into Anthbot, having several archers around to try to get rid of all these anglers, which I do see being effective. 
And unfortunately, that caretaker has gone down. The conches are not there. That's... I really... Okay, there's one conch, actually. Bleeding does have a conch set up. Legomenon on the case. But the one conch, that's the only thing available. And that's... Alongside a bunch of Mistrals trying to stop this archer. And unfortunately, it just... Mistrals are great against the Sirens, are good enough, but they're not going to help against the archers. At least not easily. And this looks to be it. Gorda's Gorda and Crow pushing in hard. There's not a whole lot left to defend against anything. And Bleatnik looking to throw in the towel. That is it. Gorda and Crow take that and move on to the winner's finals. That was that was quite well done there. I mean, I wasn't entirely sure how that was going to go, but as you can see, it it worked out. I mean, you had a bit of a weird situation with the Ravens. Didn't really pan out at first, but you now killing the commanders, that slowed down expansion and general defense over the sides. Not a huge amount because the C-map doesn't really support much commander usage, but there is still a fact that this entire shallow section here is, you know, it's very commander friendly. So there's a lot that commanders can do, especially on the front lines. I would expect if Legomenon had their commander left, they would have been reclaiming a bunch of this. Although, to be fair, that is another thing. Gorda was just mass-building Mariners. That was a great move. That led to all the reclaim being taken for the southwest side, and of course, that just turns into more units. And if you look at the reclaim value here... Actually, it's surprisingly even, all things considered. Bleeding did look like they had some conscious here and there to reclaim, but... Yeah, had the game gone on any longer, there would have been all this reclaim going over. And it's still 3,000 metal reclaim. That's still loads. And a good few minutes of getting like 70, 80 metal, or 80, 90 metal per second for Southwest. So yeah, that map actually worked out remarkably well for 2v2. Gotta say, I am, I am really happy we played on this map. Or really happy the players to, chose to play on Shimmer Shore. That was, that was a great game. So yeah, we're gonna be moving on to the next winners semi or winners final no semis winner semis match. It's going to be a match between Penwin and Saber and Anir and Asinane. Oh, not gonna lie, I was actually expecting Steel Blue and Insert to take that, but we are going to be watching Penwin and Saber and Anir and Asinane, which makes me feel really good about having watched this one because we're going to see all new players. I don't think I've seen any of these players at all in this entire tournament series. In fact, I don't think these players have played all in this entire tournament series. It doesn't ring a bell. Wait. Oh, they're apparently watching one of the losers bracket matches. Okay, we're gonna have to wait a bit. Not sure what they're waiting for. Fine, I'll start the room. Oh, versus Penwin and Saber. Okay, well, at any rate, we can have to wait for them. I don't really want to go to a break because I have to cut the video. Hmm. Unfortunately, I think the match that they're watching is going to end very soon. It has, in fact, just ended. Okay, good. We can get going. Phew. That is, that is good. And apparently I can't set limits on... Oh, I see. I can. No changing speed. Sorry, that, bugged. that bugged me. I That really shouldn't be allowed. So yeah, Penguin and Save versus Anir and Asinane is the match we are watching right now, and they are currently in the process of dealing with the maps. So, actually, we've gotten them all done. Let's see, Izki, Firebreak, Shimmer. 
Uh, oh, they're, they're on Zed. They're on Zed. We're going to see Zed. How about that? All right, cool. Wait to see how that plays out. I mean, I have my... I had all my hypotheses. I've gone over them, but now we shall actually see how that map plays. I expect it'll be interesting, but I'm not sure how that's going to pan out. <sighs> because, well, that's... Uh, that's a thing. Oh, it's obviously it's entirely up to the players how they play it out. We haven't I haven't really seen two v two on this. Oh, oof! I just realized this is tiny start box. Not ideal. Very shiny though. Forgot how shiny this map is. Someone actually used the map reflectex. Okay. So we have spiders and shield bots on the north side. And we have Cloaky and shield bots on the south side. So Saber and Penwin taking on Steel Blue and Insert to get here. I was a little surprised. Steel Blue is. I mean, I'm not sure how strong of a player Insert is, but Steel Blue is very much. I think it's like third or fourth place right now overall, right? Fourth place in the overall ratings. Behind Gorda, Randy, and Dregs. So, yeah, with that kind of competition, that's saying a lot. So, I'd say Penwin and Saber are ones to watch here. Simon and Anir, though, are st absolutely strong players. Like, they are still going to be tough competition here. And I expect that will show itself shortly. As you see already, that's this ramp... I was talking about, or at least trying to defend that, making sure nothing can come up it without causing problems. Seeing as Mumble Clan decided to go for spiders, that is a legitimate threat. I mean, this is, I believe, this is bot pathable, but for spiders, it's even more pathable because that's how spiders work. They don't care. Is it continuous ground? They can move on it. There's no water in the way. They can move on it. It's totally fine. So, for now, Mumble Clan taking a little bit of extra center control. Southwest looking to find a little bit of Saber. Trying to find something, harassment-wise. Finds out their opponents have gone Spiders, which is still useful information. That is, that's actually really good to know. And in a minute, switch over to Knights as a result of seeing that. I suppose deciding that they don't need to worry about mid-weight Raiders, they just have to worry about you know, slower, like, riot units or skirmishers. But fleas aren't really going to be a problem. I have enough glaives to deal with them if they come up. On the other hand, Penwin can go in for a little bit of raiding to see what's going on and won't find much. I mean, they find the other factory if they didn't know it already, but also find death. That being said, the center, it's just, it's going to be a tug of war over the center. Like I said, that's how Zed plays. This center area here is the most important area on the map. If that gets taken, then the players can just completely run wild with it. And that's exactly what Southwest wants to prevent Mumble Clan from doing, because the Zion has already got one of the metal extractors, already sitting in a bit of a fire base there. And is doing a lot to push back Saber and Penwin. They aren't going to be managing to hold on to this without actually, you know, killing some units, getting some real ground on it. And the sign and I also double checking to make sure that nothing comes along the ramps. So but pretty clever with that. I, I like that approach. And they understand the map well enough to know what they have to be mindful of. That being said, Night Reaver is a scary combo, and this Thug Outlaw is not well equipped to deal with it. So again, the southwest kind of gets a bit more territory. Saber's commander finally getting in a position to actually build up some more metal extractor. But of course, it'll come down to whether or not the southwest can actually hold on to the metal extractors because Mumble Clan's got a solid position. It's going to be... It's an uphill battle just to get into these metal extractors over here. But for Saber and Penwin, they only have one under... Uh, well, they only have one. 
And that one is not well defended. It's defended okay enough. Like, they're managing reasonably okay. But again, it just hasn't been one really big push yet. Mumble Glen, are they aware of this? They, oh, they're not. They actually have no idea that that Metal Extractor has been built. They could probably assume, though. I mean, there's only so many Metal Extractors on this map, and really not very many. So they probably figure sooner or later that that Metal Extractor would be taken. So flee over to South, doing a little bit of harassment. Doesn't manage to find much, thanks to the Lotus, but does get a lot of information about what's going on in the base. Nothing really out of the ordinary, though. Just more caretakers. No, nothing, no air switch or gun zip switch or any other trickery. But that's still useful information. Knowing that that's not a threat means that Mumble Clan knows they can continue to focus entirely on maintaining ground control rather than having to focus on anti-air. Center of the map, though, actually is starting to go more and more in favor of Southwest. Mumble Clan coming in with a felon a few recluses to try to tip the balance of power back in their favor. But really nothing decisive has happened. It's just been a split. Getting some reclaim from Rainier, though. Nice thinking. Mostly for energy, but still. Take out some of that. I mean, this is still metal. 60 metal across. The entire forest. We see similar, similar strategy coming in from Saber. They... I mean, both players, they know what they need to do here. Get the reclaim. That's the only real economy left, honestly. Our Southwest... Oh, see, I'm a little uncertain. I feel like we're going to be seeing some raiders coming in here to deal with this, but no, we're just seeing more assaults. Thugs coming in. Venom, or Widow from Asinone, is looking about ready to pick off a knight, perhaps. But that's... That's the only thing I can think of as a target. Still not the worst choice of target. But yeah, again, this... Ooh, this is kind of getting tricky. Sling's able to take out one of the metal extractors. Or, damage one of the metal... No, take out. Completely. Kill it. Done. Take out one of the metal extractors. Slowing things down a little bit from Mumble Clan. I mean, Southwest, they're still... They don't have as much overdrive. They don't have as much metal as a result of that. But they are managing to hold the line remarkably well. Yeah, Southwest is doing okay. Getting care. Oh, Saber with a clever little buried caretaker. How much reclaim is it near it? Not a whole lot. Yeah, there's like. It's. Yeah, there's not much. Oops. So, yeah, with that, there's. Just that little extra bit. Oh, and the repair, too, of course. Yeah, a little extra bit of repair and reclaim. A little extra bit of of resource off that. But again, it's just going to come down to whatever side figures out how to break through the other one first. Should know that there are lotuses over to the southwest and the north or southeast and northwest. So any attempts to try to sneak around the main combat are going to be pretty quickly stuffed. And I don't expect that to happen until one side starts to get a definitive advantage. Southwest is definitely looking scary. They're absolutely building up the infrastructure they need to hold on to this in the long haul. But again, it's just watching out. Like, is there going to be a switch? There is a crab coming in to try to dislodge. But that's entirely the thing. We're just seeing a bunch of dis dislodges being built, a bunch of assaults being built as well to push through. Not a whole lot of... like, Not a whole lot of attempts to actually break through this apart from just throwing bodies at it until one side gives. But the knights, the knights don't give easily. Widow looking to find some useful target here. I mean, at least it is being useful for scouting, nothing else. I mean, that information advantage, that's not, that is not insignificant. Because, I mean, there isn't the same thing for Southwest. They don't really have that same degree of proper information about what's going on in the back lines. So they're, they're operating in a bit of a deficit that way, especially when it comes to, like, a rack tier falling into a stinger. That's a thing. But again, it's coming down to not getting killed. Oh, but... Oh, the bandit's coming in along the side. There is the sneaky push. This is really risky because that's... That is army value that is not on the front lines. 
but it might just work out. Big concentrated push coming over to the south side of the front line, though. Able to get rid of a Lotus, but not much else. The Bandits, same time, go over to the north, running into the Venoms. This is not worth it. There is retreat called. Pulls back all the Bandits. I mean, five of them survived. Five of them died. I'm glad to see that retreat. Nice look that they were ready to follow soon after, but nope. That is not the way to go. It's way too heavily defended. So again, that center, that's the thing. That is the ticket. And of course, this Widow actually happens to be right in the right spot. That if bandits were to come along, the Widow would spot them. Although the Widow would end up shooting one of them and then dying. But it would spot them, or would it? It's on hold fire. No, it wouldn't shoot one of them. It would just die. Yeah, that's all that would happen. Ooh. Clever area cloak, though. We have an imp coming in around here. Widow realizes it needs to go away. So this imp might end up being the thing. It's tricky, though, because the problem is that those outlaws completely stuff the use of imps regardless. But the crab is out of position, gets imps to very little avail. It doesn't actually do anything, because imps, they're damaged based entirely on the health of the unit they're firing on. And crabs have, like, well, especially when when they're closed on like that, I have effectively 12,000 HP. So, yeah. I think M steal like three or three. Or, is it 400 or is it 600? I can't remember the exact number. They, oh, 2,500. Never mind. They deal 2,500 paralysis damage, but yeah, not, it's not going to matter when you're up against 12,000 HP. The Knights likely won't have much of a chance either. Push over to the north. Oh, the South Push did actually find the metal extractor. Push over to the north. Looking for it as well, but hasn't found it. And again, the caretaker's there to repair something similar. Mumble Clan has done. The Mumble Clan going for some rovers as well, probably for an, an impaler. Bad to guess why you'd switch to a rover factory in this situation. Impalers to more reliably get rid of the caretakers, get rid of the metal extractors, get rid of any units in the back line or any units that are retreating. That would make a lot of sense to me. And overall, we are seeing just an increasing mass of units on the side of Mumble Clan. They are winning the attrition battle, and it is turning out to win them the war. But really, I think that crab actually is is the thing. That spire crab. Actually, spire crab, not just spire crab, it's also the felon ball. Felon ball is huge. And that felon ball's finally paid off, getting rid of the knights, or fully paid off, rather. Getting rid of the knights, getting rid of the caretakers, breaking the line in the center here, and that will probably be a Penwin's commander under heavy fire, but the shields have gone down. And Aegis is here to try to help, or Aspis rather is here to try to help out. It's it's helping. Got rid of another Metal Extractor Saber's commander under some threat, but it's looking iffy. Phantom not quite able to get in range to snipe out the felons, so this ultimately is still going to be able to push through. Just needs to recharge, needs to regroup a bit, maybe add a few more shields in. Going back to the Aegis in the back lines to help get that shield transfer going. Once that's set up, it can go back through the front lines and probably take out basically the rest of this. I mean, in the meantime, all the Reckless is doing their job. And that's the thing, this is about it. There's really not a whole lot else going around the map. The players have done everything they can to defend against whatever we built. And, oh, the rover was actually used for badgers. All right, fair enough. Still artillery, just not the artillery I expected. And the badgers kind of make sense. Ooh, okay. There is the sneaky push. He got the shields. He got the aspis. He got the felons. Giant shield ball over to the southeast is going to be it. Southwest realizing, well, we don't really have the center. We haven't got much else. I don't know if they see that coming. I don't think they do. No, they don't see it coming at all. But they chose to resign anyway. And that is it. Mumble Clan takes it. And here in a Saturday, move on to the winner's finals. Where we will be facing off against Gorda and Crow. But still, well played. I mean, that's that played out the way I expected it to, honestly. 
there wasn't a whole lot of sneaking around the sides because that's really easy to defend because the ground like if you look at the actual size and yes if you heard last week the camera has been fixed if you look at the ground there's it's a very very steep hill trying to contest that directly is not something one can sensibly do as we saw earlier in the match it's it is a great way to commit suicide or to lose your entire army and that holds true on both sides like it's symmetric so of course or it's rotationally symmetric so unless you have an army like this that's this giant shield ball force there's not a whole lot you can do about it which means the entire center of the map that's the only thing that matters and ultimately the mumble clan just came in with better assault units to push through the center So yeah. Oh, what was the reclaim? Oh, Mumble Clan. Okay, even up until the point where Mumble Clan really started to take the center, and then it just... Yeah, then they just took it. So pretty even, though. Give Southwest that. But ultimately, they did... They lost on attrition, and that just turned into an army value discrepancy, which turned into a game. Yeah, that is that. So, we are going to be moving on to the winner's finals. Just always as part of the same video, though in this case will have to be weirdly edited, but again, that edit happened already. So, winner's finals, go to Encrow. We saw earlier is, I mean, it's interesting. Go to Encrow definitely have a... Where's the thing... Yeah, it's that's definitely how like it's like I said, it's going to be an interesting match. Both you have Anir Anir and Golda who are just top level players, and then you have Crow who was kinda of having a bit of a tough time but has some interesting approaches when it came to a lot of parts of the game. And and Sinone who's also a very strong player, so it's gotta come down to basically if Crow's gimmicks along with Golda's solid solid covering is able to keep it near and assign an A at bay. At any rate, we have... Wait, where is Gorda? No, oh, great, we're dealing with technical problems. Well, I mean, this is going to be waiting a little bit for Golda to get back. Apparently, they had some technical problems. And they are back. All right, we can start. We can get going. Oh, and Google Frog's here. Cool. Perfect timing. Okay. Let's see, where's the thing to do the thing? All right. Hey, Google Frog, how's it going? Hello. 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 Hello, I'm here. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Yes, so we were going to have Google Frog co casting. Because that is how we do thing. Also, because oh, yeah, may as well get up at this time in the morning. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, what is what time is it for you? Like six? Well, it's uh, about seven thirty now. So oh, okay, it's not too bad. That's pretty reasonable. Yep. Sort of getting up around then, anyway. All right. Trying to switch over but, to a morning uh, schedule. I get that. But five thirty is a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. 
All right. So, Iski, <laughs> we're gonna get Iski out every time, aren't we? So we're getting to map bans now, and Iski is the first ban, as always. It's kind of funny. We got Shimmer Shore played, but not Iski. I don't know. Yeah, it's thinner. That's true. Theater. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really doesn't really work out when it comes to the two v two. Even one v one is pretty tiny. It's pretty hard to build up. I'm actually surprised we haven't really seen a lot of Hourglass or Firebreak. They seem like the maps that are really appropriate for 2v2. Like, of this pool. Well, that's a double-edged sword, because it's sort of complicated. Sea maps are sort of complicated, too. You should probably have a ship player and then a player doing something else. I mean, when we had... I, there was a Shimmer Shore match earlier between Gota Crow and Lagamon and Bagatsu, and... Goda and Crow went ships and air, while Ligon and Bakahazi went ships and And that was... That was kind of weird, because for the longest time, like, up until Crow got the Ravens to actually set up, it wasn't... It looked like it was going to be Ligon and Bakahazi just taking it. And then the Ravens worked out. So then it just sort of wasn't that. Yeah, well, C is, like, a ship factory and four support factories. Yeah. Although gunships doesn't have that much use. Not anymore, sadly. So, but it's out anyway. Shimmer Shore has been banned. As has Lonely Oasis, another map which I I guess not entirely surprised because that kind of cliffy flat map has not really been popular in the tournaments. See Mecha and Sonia. Yeah, also Lonely Oasis has these it's quite un vehicle pathable. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it is absolutely a bot map, first and foremost. But then Vantage got banned, oh. and that is vehicle pathable. We saw them in the first match today, and that yeah. worked out really well. Hmm. Although now, well, unless they... who wants Ooh. who wants to play maps with lots of different angles of attack? Right, that's true. Well, apparently these players do because Zed got banned. The map with exactly one angle of attack. Now yeah, it's down I would to imagine Anir and Essane might be worried about God are you like pushing down a side and there's only one side. Right. That's such a problem. But we are gonna be on Hourglass, ultimately. Which I am happy to see, because this is I think again the map I expect to be most conducive to 2v2 play just due to its size. Although it is a bit of a famine map, so it might be no it's not famine, it's just for 2v2 it might be a little bit low on resources. But then most of these maps are kind of low on resources. They like 40 metal on extractors in total overall, give or take. That is quite low. Yeah, for, for a 2v2. I think Shimmer Shore is 50. And yeah, most of them are in the 40 to 50 range in total. I think Zed is the highest metal one on this. Or no, Lonely Oasis would be. Or possibly Firebreak. But Zed would be, is also surprisingly high. That's like 30 per side. But it's also a really funky map where you have to basically just fight a siege ma match in the center. It's like just artillery Zed, back and Zed forth. Zed is weirdly sort of more of a team's map. It's more played in team games. Yeah, which I can kind of get because there's a lot of metal and it's there's sort of angles to work with. But at the same time, it's it is still just the front line. Which I guess is just all team maps anyway. It's just you have the front line. Just this map. This map just makes it weirdly compressed. Yep, and you can go around the sides if you want for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, if you have a large enough force, it's a little bit tricky otherwise. But still, I expect we're going to be. I mean, for hourglass, it's probably going to end up. I'll see. So this map... I kind of expect an east-west split in terms of resources. And then working from there. Because the players start southwest and northeast, but most of the resources are in the southeast and northwest. Yes. 
Oh, it depends which way they go. As in, you can crawl upwards or like jump across to the right and put yeah, a bunch of turrets jumping down across. And there. Yeah, that's the hard part, though, is you have to jump across instead of turrets because there's no choke points. Whereas north south, there's just loads of natural choke points. This is a lot. It should be a lot easier to hold, I would think. But then again, I don't know how often these players have played on this particular map in a team's context, so. That will be probably more a question of how much experience they have, how much they're experimenting versus how much they're going off of previous knowledge. I've honestly only seen this map once in tournament. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what they think you can do here. Yeah, I'm... I am expecting we're going to be getting... Okay, sorry, if you're wondering what's taking... What's the holdup, we are actually waiting for a near... They decided now is a great time to take a break. So, you know, they'll be back eventually. What are the other games doing? They are playing on Hourglass and Vantage. Okay. Yep. So, I like I said before, I kind of expect Hourglass... I expected Hourglass to be a map played more often. Vantage, I wasn't surprised to see in the first map, but it has been banned a bit. I'm... I honestly expect we're not going to see Firebreak if we do, or Lonely Oasis, if we do, I'd be very surprised. And we surprisingly saw both streamers were in Zed. Firebreak. I think we might see it if someone wants to have a an unwieldy match. A match, a swinging one, one that could go either way. Right. Feels like with Firebreak, there's approaches that can make you lose the game pretty quickly. As in, approaches on the base. Mm -hmm. So, if someone thinks that they're disadvantaged, they might go for it and then try and approach the base up the cliff on the sort of corners of the map. Yeah, that, that relies on both, on almost like both players thinking that, because honestly, it's... Mm, with the band like, system. Yeah, with the band system, you have to convince both players, or both teams, that yep. that map is actually okay. Which is not an easy task. That's more what it comes down to. I don't expect it to be played just because it's kind of an unfair... Oh, never mind. This map's got plenty of resources. What am I saying? A famine map. You got 20 resources right in the start location. Or 20 metal per second right in the start location. Nah, this map's got plenty. Yeah, it should work really well for 2v2. I don't know how I forgot. Oh, wait a sec. Oh, wait a sec. Does this map have different... I gotta check. I think this map might have different metal points for a number of players. Like, I think it it's fewer might, for 1v1. Although I think this is the same as usual, just from memory. I just don't remember the, in the corners. I remember there being 1 plus 2, not 3 plus 2s. Like on the oh. corner plateau. Oh no, there's always been three twos over there. Oh, okay, well then I'm just... What the heck map was I trying out? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, that's... So Crow going for air, unsurprisingly. Goldie going for hovers, also kind of unsurprisingly. And an ear and a sign and I are yet to pick what they're doing. Well, rover's coming in, okay. That uh, appears to be a sign. No, that's an ears. That's teal. Chat pointing out that Hourglass has loads of reclaim, but no one ever plays it like a reclaim map. Yeah, I mean, it's got reclaim, but it's all spread out. I guess people don't think about it. So, where the heck is... Where's the sign in there? I suppose, um, not placing so that the game doesn't start. 
No, I don't see their cursor. Oh, there, there's their cursor. Should play okay. pretty soon, though. Game starting in 20 seconds. Doesn't yep. want to end up. Oh, there it else. is. Yeah, Jump so bots. And here in Assassin's look like they're trying some kind of strategy, some kind of push, some kind of something. In a, a strategy in a strategy game, you say? What a novel concept. Because it looks like God A and Crow is pl playing. God A plays one v one hovers. Yeah. While Crow annoys you there. That's what happened during the sea game on Shimmer Shore. God is playing 1v1 ships until enough ravens are built up. Although now we're not seeing ravens. We're, oh, we are seeing ravens eventually. Although we're not seeing deception. Crow's actually making it very obvious. In the Shimmer Shore match, Crow was hiding the ravens as best they could. Now they're just using this to scout. Which, I mean, I guess isn't super surprising. But now their opponents know, oh, we gotta deal with air. Gotta build some flex AA, maybe some fencers. Maybe some crashers. It's a more open map, so even if you know they have air, your advantage from having air yep. isn't diluted oh. all that much. Yep. Also, reclaim being taken. Players know exactly what to do here. It's been played like yeah, a reclaim map. Yeah, have played this map. Yeah. I think SNA made this map. Maybe that was someone else. I don't know. I can't really check right now, but that would be kind of cool if they did. I think it's a I think it's a nice map. I think it's I think the design's really cool, like from a just general layout perspective. So yeah, I'm happy we're seeing it played. Yeah, it is by S9. Oh cool. Alright, well good job you. Is it's a good map. Anyway. So I think I think the two questions are how effective will planes be? And what is the jump bot factory for? Yeah. Which is quite a slow choice for a map this open. I have to have uh, some plan for it. I mean, the only thing I could think of is if they were trying to use rovers to pin their opponents into a small space and then use firewalkers to assault it. But that wouldn't make sense because you'd switch into jump bots with the firewalkers. You wouldn't, you wouldn't plop jump bots. Yeah, if you could pin your opponent in place, you would just take the sides and do whatever you liked with the metal. Exactly. Which looks like exactly what Momoclan is trying to do. I mean, they're... You no, know, Dagger versus Scorcher. The daggers do have a pretty significant advantage here. Same time, Raven's coming in for the Pyros. Ooh. Maybe it's just Pyro Assault. Like, they just want to go for heavy raiders to go into their opponents. It's into... Well, clearly into place with the moderator, but again, I kind of see your point. This is a, this isn't that big of a map. Oh, but the Scorchers take advantage of their range to deal with the daggers, keeping that alpha strike yeah, at the bay. Yeah, can fight dagger, except the problem is when the dagger gets a critical mass, and that's just yeah. But the dagger had a critical mass. It just got the critical mass got dis, dis got disturbed, got messed up. So it ended up not being a local critical mass, and the Scorchers could take some kills. Nicely done there, though now the daggers are a threat. Got six of them coming in. Any scorchers found out of position are dead. And here's commander is fine though. Lotuses are fine too. Now we're seeing yeah. There's the south. There's the southward push from Mumble Clan. Northward push from southwest side. That kind of as I thought. Yeah, north south. Feeling the double. Um land factory effect though they're expanding a bit faster well i don't know actually, are they they're not expanding a bit faster yeah it doesn't feel like it i mean they're they have two commanders out which is pretty good although uh, crow's got that commander yeah crow's entirely got their commander they have one crane but basically the commander is the way they're getting in and out of here but i I still think the two land factors will be useful pretty shortly. I mean, the Ravens aren't finding a whole lot of purchase. Unfortunately, it is essentially a 1v2 situation with Gulda against the entire team, Mumble Clan team. And now the placeholder is coming in. Now we're seeing where the jump bots are paying off. Probably why they went for them. Like, it's a big map, and units are slow. I'm, yeah. I'm more interested in Moderator, actually. If they can 
keep the dagger mass to the spread, the moderator is a good way of making attrition. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, because they one-shot daggers, so... I was fairly certain they do. Yeah, they one-shot daggers, absolutely. And the I know my numbers. are doing quite well. That's what I mean. Like the, because of the crushers, the ravens haven't really been able to get a whole lot. Well, hadn't been able to get a whole lot of mileage. There's some opening now, but well, still having to build crashes is mileage. That's true. They but they only kill, forced kill two pyros. Yeah, but they only forced two crashers. Well, three now. But this this dagger push over to the southeast. That's the bigger concern. And crow is actually using that with a crane to take more metal, so ultimately this is working out reasonably well for the Southwest team. The only downside is lack of production capacity, which is true of Mumble Clan as well. No one's got caretakers. Rather surprisingly. Now there's one for the jump off factory. What that's worth. Where is that? Next to the jump off factory. Oh yeah, sorry, one caretaker. Sorry, I thought you were like Saying, well, that's one that's one point for the jump bot factory, and like, what? What, what, what was the jump bot factory in those especially good? No, one character, uh, yes, under construction. Just going into more dagger factories. Yep, there's the plates. So I can see that for what Gold is doing, absolutely making mass daggers. Though, is that gonna work? Ah, it's gonna work. Yeah, that this uh, this north side is totally defended. And uh, Crow Oof. has been taking out the turrets with the ravens. So basically turn it into more of a dagger um, mm -hmm. fest. And expanding with the cranes is good. They're quite fast. They can re-expand to far well, away spot. They were. <laughs> then they died. Yeah, but you just make another crane, send it out when that That's true. is solved, and you've saved saved a few minutes. Yeah, Otherwise, compared to most like constructors. Yeah, I totally get that. SNA is trying puppies, which will kill ravens. That's... Are we still seeing more ravens coming in? We are still seeing more ravens come in, actually quite consistently. Getting to Phoenix is built on top of that because I think that's Crow's favorite unit, but I don't know how well they're going to work here. I mean, there's not a whole lot of lightweight units to hit with a Phoenix. Yeah, actually, the raiders can spread out quite a bit. Yeah, so yeah, these aren't... Bot raiders it makes sense against, but vehicle raiders not so much. And an ear. Although good on the reclaim. Crow has hit a bottleneck in rearming his ravens. Needs to get a repair pad and some energy to power them. Yeah, that's something that happened in the C game too. I think that's. I mean, I am looking at Crow's play. They have improved in the sense that they aren't trying to just use a critical mass of ravens to kill like factors or commanders. They're focusing on metal extractors and turrets and other small but important targets. Getting yeah, a lot of mileage off of each individual one. Commander. Commander bombing here would be quite important. Would be. A question of the crashers. The crasher. It's down. The commander is very vulnerable right now. There's the bomb attempt. And. It'll get him it, down to 400. So. Yeah. Can the daggers go in? No. It doesn't quite. Gets him down to 1200. Well, so, oh, in. yeah. There it is. Yep. Okay. That's. That, right? Yep. Okay. I, I did not. And that is going to completely stuff Anir's attempt to expand over to the north and reclaim all that stuff. God Ace Commander's right there. So he's got himself 2,000 reclaim. Yep. Yeah, that that is huge. I mean, we're seeing already Anir desperately trying to defend that reclaim field because they don't want to ha let it go to their opponents, but I don't know if they're going to be able to do that. I'm seriously suspicious of that. At the same time, south side, we do have a bit of an assault setting up, but that reclaim field, that is super important. Golda's commander is alive enough and healthy enough against the ra the Scorchers. They are not going to be under threat yet. The more Scorchers coming in are... Ooh, Scorcher Dart. I don't know, in those numbers, that commander is not looking too happy. Yeah, he's jump away. But to what right. end? I mean, the Dart's going to slow them down. Ooh, it's trying to jump up. Oof! Nope, that's it. That's Golda's commander uh, down. Reclaim field is... It was just slightly too far from both cliffs. Yep. It needed to stand somewhere where it could jump immediately. Yeah, and reinforcements coming in further along with masons to help take the reclaim field. So Looks... now there's masons. In this situation, yep. you look at how close are the closest constructors to the reclaim field. 
Really nothing and, for Goddard. Yeah, exactly. Commander was the only option, so Aeneas managed to completely secure this reclaim field. I mean, the daggers are going to be a persistent problem, but the very least... Well, the masons, the masons can't live there happily so far. No, 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 no. But still, that's eight metal per second that's been taken away from southwest side. Mumble Clan still accessing, but accessing with a much stronger base, and not by much anyway. And Crow building the air pad you were talking about. Realizing the yeah, bottleneck. Forward air pad. Slightly forward air pad. They are still um, stalling energy, though, so... They need the energy to power the air pad. Yep. Yeah, I don't know why they're not building... I mean, maybe just an oversight. Geo soon as well. That's certainly... If they can support all these ravens, that's certainly a worrying amount. Yeah, uh, it's named starting a plane factory on the right. Maybe get some fighters to contest this. I mean, that seems like a good idea. There's actually quite a critical mass of ravens right now. How many are it's there? A weird spot for it though. Fifteen. I guess it's buying some puppies, so it's slightly defended from ravens. But that commander and that factory could all be killed by the number of ravens there are at the moment. Yeah, it is definitely a tricky situation. I think, I think they're fine. I mean, for one thing. Southwest has uh, no idea. Crow's trying to kill Scorchers with Ravens, which doesn't work all that well. Well, not for the Ravens, definitely for the Scorchers, though. I mean, Mumble Clan just got a... They got... They got a Christmas present handed to them early. If they can reclaim it. Because, look, God has moved up. The reclaim field was by no means decided. That's earlier. true. They might actually puppy it. Hmm. Probably the best idea, all things considered. They puppy the, the reclaim field. The options available and there are some puppies coming in. Yeah, but the Masons are the higher priority. It looks like Anir really wants to just grab that as a normal reclaim field. Yeah, they seem to be... The puppies have moved back. Maybe they're talking about what it's going to be used for. Yeah, that being said, the puppies are coming in. Oof. Deal some damage. That air pad is still under construction. Mumble Clan not really putting a lot of resources into it yet. I don't think it's actually finding some purchase, but yeah, that that air pad is still it's still unknown. It's still on her. It's still not something that is being threatened yet. But uh, that being said, go to yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's hovercrafts. You want to have torpedoes, right? I'm like, you know, ignore the fact that they're go to hovercrafts and so forth, but yeah. Actually, well, the wouldn't the land urchin be, be able to effective. shoot into the puddle right there? Like, right next to it? No, I, it wouldn't. The torpedo, I reckon it would try, but it would bounce on the ground and explode, like, here. Yeah. Right. Well, it doesn't really matter, though. That urchin is going to go down along with all the quills that have been built up here. That stinger, eh, it's not going to last long enough. Yeah. It doesn't even They're get seeing up. the weakness of using one blob of daggers to try and hold the entire map in a 2v2 because the bottom side has been unassaulted for a lot of the game. Well, yeah, well, a lot of the game, but... this last half of the game. Well, yeah, but that has well, changed to rapidly. The top. One of the yes, places has gone down... half of the game, though. <laughs> Which very well could be the last part of the game, all things considered. The reclaim field of the north is securely in Anir's hands. The Pyros yeah, have no true. competition over in Golda's base. They've taken out all the all the plates, only the main factory remains, and that might just go down. Yeah, it's not even gonna last. There it is. Yeah, or it doesn't even matter. Yeah. But yeah, no land forces. No land forces, They're minimal air out. forces, Swift's already up. And Golda doesn't want to the... resign though. Ah. Huh. Despite calling the vote in the first place. Weird. Maybe he didn't notice they had a, a liquor and they thought they could get something from it, but... Now that's it. There it is. That is the game, and we are... Looking at Anir and a Cyanine moving on to the Winner's Finals. Or sorry, the Grand Finals. Not the Winner's Finals. That was the Winner's Finals. Moving on to the Grand Finals, while Golda and Crow will be down to the loser's bracket, trying to work their way back up. Well, trying to win the loser's finals to get back in. So, good job to them, and we will be back after a short break to look at how the loser's bracket is proceeding. So stay tuned. Ah, uh, look at the army value. 
Yeah, right, we'll look at him real one sec. Shows. Ooh. Wow. Got a struggling to maintain a land force against those two. Oh, yeah. Crow was doing fine. Well, but the yeah, was, was just... there. But the energy income was not there to maintain it. No, that is absolutely a thing. And once the front stabilized, the Mumble Clan got some ability to deal with the aircraft. It wasn't so destabilizing. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, but that was. Now, that was definitely a, a problem. Like, Dota's land army was pretty much entirely daggers. Yeah. So, I guess the cost isn't completely indicative because it was doing a lot for its value. Like, if you look at value killed, go to. Gota, despite their low army value, was keeping track with Anir, who I believe had the highest army value, or yep. most of the game had the highest army value. So definitely, while Gota's army value was low, it was remarkably efficient. Uh, that's interesting, too. The difference between Anir and Essanane in, um, in value killed, mm -hmm. more because they had to fight over the top reclaim field, which made the reclaim field get larger, while Essanane sort of used that time to solidify the south and build up some kind of switch, you know, going into air and puppy cloaker. Yeah. Which then led to the pyros that pushed into the end again in the kills. So I think the answer to what the jump jet bot factor is for, it was for puppies. At least it turned out to be for puppies in the end. Yeah, this one like it was for... Taking those reclaim fields with puppies does seem like it could be okay. And they are hard to kill with attrition. That's true. I mean, the reclaim fields just completely undo their attrition. So it's like, good luck fighting them. They're turning, they're getting more puppies as you're fighting them in the reclaim field. Kind of done. And of course, Constable's a good constructor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that slow beam is a nice little bit of defense. On top of the jumping. The jumping is always good. Yeah, with the cliffs. Yep. So, I assume they're going on to next game. Yeah, I was going to take a short break before the next game because I just split up the video. But yeah, so we'll be back in a in like a minute or two with the probably the loser semifinals. I think that's going to be what will end up being played. That would judging, make sense. Yeah, I'm just judging by what's currently running. Yeah. Well, Saber and Penwin are in. It's just the Legama and Backer has a Madcraft Typing Fred game, which is just which should be closing up in a second. So back to loses. Half an hour. I'll just take a look. Okay. Just a sneaky look. Well, I'm not jumping to it until after a break anyway, or yep. at all. But yeah. So we'll be back in just a minute with the loser semifinals. So stay tuned. <laughs> 